notícia isso. Oh, Nashville, you're being funny. <laughs> oh. Hey. 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 Oh. Hey. Hey. She's being sweet. Yeah. At least. That's weird. See ya. For his other stuff. Joe doesn't like it when I'm making when I'm making go back. Haven't you ever just wondered what something sounded like? Slowed down or sped up or fucked up or whatever? That's all I hear. Oh, what do we got here? Hey, baby. How you doing? <laughs> this is too much beer pong right here. <laughs> That's what that is. When your table falls apart. There's been too many parties on it. How does this look? Bad? Minute six. What'd you say to me? I said I'm not smoking. I can do it too. You can quit. Welcome. 
be kind of close to the. Yeah. Well, keep going. Oh, right let's let's do it again. <laughs> oh. I mean that'll be good, but yeah, keep walking. Okay. I'll let you. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Mister. Wait for action. Oh, I didn't know we were like in the midst of it. Yeah, why not? What? Oh. Action. Oh, I see. I see. You're calling me a whore. It's fine. Maybe that makes it nicer. Right? <laughs> I'm a firm believer that if you have pictures of hot people next to you, you automatically look hotter. <laughs> I do believe that, actually. It's usually the opposite. Just, you know, chill out here. <laughs> Be cool. This is where I hang, you know. Okay, maybe. Stand up and then. Yeah. 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 Do you see this? Like, this is what my life has come to. That I have my headphones taped together. Because they're beats. They make everything sound better, but I don't care if they're all broken. Lifetime warranty my ass. Dude, Dre hooked me up. Where's my next pair? your hand. Jackson one I'm working on. Okay. Seashells. So, uh, I remember I bought this light bright down here uh, at a thrift store. I found it for like five bucks, and I had the hardest time finding any pegs for it. So, uh, so Seashells from Hit Record said that she uh, was cleaning out. Uh, she was cleaning out a garage or something, and she found a bunch of light bright pegs. So she sent half of them to me, and then she sent this letter with it, uh, just about some stuff that she was going through in her life, and, um, I mean, I think it's neat. I think it's neat that on Hit Record we connect as more than just artists, you know? The divorce that she was going through. Flip through it a little bit. I 
this is just for you. So what, uh, oh yeah, say your name. Um, hey, I'm House of Glitch. Jeremy Henry. It's my real name. Um, I'm trying to remember what, um, what Hmm? Hmm? What did you say? Which one it was? No, 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 I remember which one it was. Um, I was just trying to remember, like, where I was when, uh, when I heard that. So I remember my friend, my friends Kenny and Aviva, they were the ones that told me that uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt had some kind of online something or other. And I remember I read about it on Wikipedia, and I was like, oh yeah, that's what they were talking about. So I went to the website, and I watched like the New Deal video and the About Hit Record, and that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to remix this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remix what Joe is saying. And... Uh, he had so many things that he was saying about like intellectual property rights and um, the copyright laws, and those were just things that, that I personally feel strongly about just because my art is remix art. I can't make my art without something else to reference. Um, so, I mean, the laws are kind of bullshit right now. They're really outdated. You know, you can record anything, anywhere with your phone. So, um, anyway. So I, uh, I downloaded those videos and uh, put the audio into my computer, and then I started uh, started slicing it up, and um, I kind of liked the way that the hit 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 record um, was coming together, and so then we just I made a beat around that, and um, and put that up on the site, not really understanding anything about how the site worked because I still had like like Mark on there saying, great job, can you resource everything that you used? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so, um, but that was my first hit record experience. And, uh, and it was great. It was, it was nice to be able to say what I wanted to say and make something that, that really represented the art that I wanted to make. Um, and to have it not only understood, but embraced by a collaborative community. I mean, it's not much better than that, you know? Okay. Whatever, however you can work that into the same thing. Okay. Um, okay, so what was I? Um, oh, that I'm a remix artist. And that... Uh, I wouldn't really... Yeah, that my art doesn't exist without... Um, other people's. Okay, so. Okay. Um, you know, my art wouldn't exist even, a as a remixer, it wouldn't even exist without technology the way that it is today. I mean, um, I mean, a remixer as a career didn't even exist, uh, you know, 40 years ago. You know, it's with the invention and advancement of technology that different art forms are able to uh, to progress and evolve. Um, glitch as an art form and as a genre uh, is based on the fact that we have technology and that the technology has imperfections at this point and therefore there are glitches uh, in it. So without Without technology, this genre wouldn't exist, much less how we create it wouldn't exist. So we owe a lot to that. I don't know, I mean, I can play a guitar. I can play the piano. I can, I can do some line drawing, not the best, but... There's something about taking those ideas that are in your head and and I can actually make them with a computer, you know, I can I can do a couple of clicks of my mouse and I've got all my command keys ready and and I can create this sound in my headphones I, I, I can't use a paintbrush to save my life, you know 
the technology gives me a tool to be an artist. Whereas, a hundred years ago, I might not have been. I can be the kind of artist that I want to be because I'm living in a time that I've got the technology to do it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Selection process. <laughs> that's funny. Um, I don't have a selection process. I I kind of work in the constraints that I'm given. Um, sometimes I like to challenge myself, and I'll say, "Okay, I'm going to do a mega mix by this artist, and here's 40 songs, and I'm going to try to use all 40 of them." You know, I mean, I, I just want to see if I can. Sometimes. Which sounds like it has no artistic value whatsoever. <laughs> but it's a challenge. I like that. Um, I think... I'm not sure that f using found sound is more important than creating sound. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that. I think that I'm at a point in my art where I choose to use found sound because it's more challenging for me. It pushes me in a different direction. You know, I can listen to a song and be like, oh, it's missing this one little melody line, you know, and I could easily get a guitar and play that little melody line and fill it in. You know, it's different to have three different, you know, guitar sounds from three different genres of music and then trying to make those sound like they belong in the same song. You know, I, I like the chaos, you know. I'm the guy that goes to a thrift store and I find the big bin that you got to dig through everything, uh, you know, and you're digging out for that one gem. Like, that's kind of how I feel with uh, with the music. I take whatever found sounds I've got and how are they useful? How can I make them work? What what story can I tell? What what two things would you never think would go together? And then I'm going to find a way to make them go together. Um, what kind of perspective can I put out there and make somebody look at it from a different angle in a way that they never would have? That's the beauty of Remix, is that it shouldn't sound anything like the original. It should be something different. It should have something different to say. So. Okay. I mean, no, nothing of mine would exist if it weren't for other artists. No, oh, absolutely. Um, I'm inspired by a lot of different things. Uh, it, it's really exciting to get to bring all of that into the music as well. I mean, I look at... Uh, I actually have a bunch of records over here. I was actually going through. Some of these are like the first records that I ever bought. Actually, this one was. Janet Jackson's Escapade. This is the first record that I ever bought. And Shep Pettibone did all these remixes for it. And uh, I was actually going through to figure out what of all of uh, what all of his remixes that I had. And he was one of the first... He was the first. He really invented the mega mix, the modern mega mix as we know it today. And um, <laughs> it's really funny how much... God... Um, I'm sorry. I, uh, I was going to tell you about that. I, I don't want to tell you about that. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Um, I got sidetracked for a second. Um, um, anyway, he really invented the Mega Mix, so he, uh, he was very instrumental in, um, in what I do now, and that was where I really kind of got my first idea, uh, my first example of taking these different, uh, sounds and putting them together, and, uh, he was very, um, <clears throat> he was probably one of the first people that could have called themselves a remixer. Um, 
and he got to work with so many different artists. I mean, as a remixer and as a producer and a songwriter, he worked with Madonna and Janet and a string of other people. And um, I really I kind of wanted to be like that. I, I've always wanted to work with other artists. Um, and so I try to I try to use other people's art. I try to put my art out there through theirs, through it's like looking at what they do through uh, well, through my ears, I guess. Uh, I like to put a different spin on those things, but without what they do, without that found sound, I, I wouldn't have anything. Otherwise, I would just be sitting with a guitar and I would write songs, and then those would be my own, you know? But this is kind of how I get to collaborate with Janet Jackson, and you know, I get to work with Missy Elliott because I, I took her songs and worked with them, you know, and and I just kind of imagine that that's what it would be like if I spent a day in the studio with Missy, is, is that we would make this craziness together, you know. So then, when uh, when I did the live acts uh, mega mix, I mean that's what it was too. I had. I had this sample of Joe, and I had uh, the the lemonade, uh, and like all this spoken word poetry, and and these different like indie artists, and it was like I was getting to sit in a room with all of them, and you know I had so much appreciation for this this slam poetry, and and like the the little comedy thing that I only use, like the one little snippet of, like I watched that and. I emailed Sarah and I told her, I was like, I love your stand-up, I think it's so funny. Um, I feel very married in a way to, to this other art that these other artists have made. Um, and I think that I have to do that so that as an artist I feel okay about uh, slicing the shit out of it. Because I do. Like, I tear it up, I'll play it backwards, and I'll make... I'll bring Joe's pitch up, <laughs> and he gets really mad about that. And, um, but you know, like I'll, I'll tear it up. I'll, I'll make it sound any other way than, than what it does. Just, just to see what it does. Just to see how it works. Just to see if it fits better with the other part. And then they all come together. But, but I would have no art without all those parts to play with. Like, I'd have nothing. Does it bug me or did it? Um, I work better on, like, little bitty segments. When, uh, when I was studying uh, directing, I was a theater major in college, and when I was studying directing, uh, my professors would always tell me that I focused too much on these little bitty pictures on stage and I would create these pretty pictures and uh, I would miss the big picture sometimes. Uh, well, uh, I do that with my songs too. I'll focus like really hard. The way I actually do it is I'll play from the very beginning until something catches me. Like something will pull me out of the moment, uh, pull me out of the beat, and I'll be like, oh, that doesn't sound right. And then I will go to that little part and I'll work that one little part over and over and over again until it sounds right. And when I think I've got it, I'll start back at the beginning and I'll play through. And if I can make it past that part, then I keep going until the next part. And I'm like, oh, oh something's not right there. That transition doesn't work or whatever. Or like in the very beginning when I'm working, um, I'll kind of have an idea of what it is I want to say or, or the words that I want to try. And then... So I'll play around with how to chop them up and rearrange them. And I'll make like a pretty basic 4, 8, 16 count, something like that. And then if it works, uh, I'll just copy and paste that over and over again. And then, um, and then see how different things fit with it. So to answer your question about whether or not it's tedious, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. Um, but it's okay. I mean, usually, 
I'll work real hard to get something, and then everything else will fall into place. It's like a Sudoku puzzle, you know? I'm like, oh, I already used the nine there, so perfect. So. Is it, um, being a digital artist, uh, do you think it's more of a conscious effort trying, you know, saying, because you know if a transition doesn't work and you know, like, how much of it is kind of theory and how much of it is just messing around and eliminating mm. Well, I have to imagine that a great deal of it is still messing around because there's, I still do some weird stuff. <laughs> um... I don't know. I, uh, I mean, while I am, while I'm trained in some ways musically, I mean, I've never had a music theory class, you know, um, Ask me your question again. Okay, okay. Um, how much of your process is, not maybe even theory, but how much of it, when you get to a point that you feel kind of uncomfortable with, how much, how much do you know, uh, are you, do you ever know, like, okay, well, this is what I have to do to do this, and this is what I have to go do to go for this, or is it just uh, building up and then eliminating, or experimenting, or how much is experimenting, and... There's a lot of experimenting in the beginning, um, just to see how things sound together or uh, apart. Like I just play around um, and see what comes out of it, and then and then I try to create from that. Sometimes I, I mean I drive around and I listen to these songs over and over and over again, um, over and over and over and over again, and sometimes I can listen to it and I'm like oh, that's what I need to do. Oh, I can just move this and this. Or, oh, it's just that little transition, and if I just move that, then that'll work. And sometimes I'll just be like, that doesn't work. I don't know what it is, but that is where that doesn't work. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, the second verse of the Live Axe Mega Mix uh, before we redid it for the recollection. I just remember thinking something about that second verse doesn't work. I don't know what it was. And I, I don't know what it is. It's something about it did not feel as good uh, as the, uh, the rest of the song. And so um, so we got rid of it completely, just chopped it out. That was all we knew to do. And so then we just played around. Um, and I think I tried like three different things after that point too just to see what would work. I have no absolutes. I have a few things that I try pretty regularly um, to see how the rest of the song reacts. You know, I usually have a build in my songs and build like some big grand something or other. Um, so I usually kind of know structurally how I compose stuff so I know where things will fall in but but a lot of it is just trial and error and seeing what what my ears can handle you know there's a lot of stuff going on in my songs sometimes do you um do you ever like worry that since you've heard something so many times and you're getting tired of it, maybe you're missing certain parts, or maybe, you know. Oh, yeah. No, I know for a fact I miss stuff. I know for a fact. Um, I'll tell you this. I, uh, I actually had an entry in the Slightly Stupid Remix contest, and it actually got an honorable mention. And I listened to it in headphones and never listened to it outside of headphones to see how the different frequencies sound. Uh, and there was something in the treble line that never came through on the headphones that just, like, I can't listen to it now. Like, I can't listen to it at all. Like, it kills me. Um, but I listened to it so, so, so much that I think I did get numb. 
to that. Um, I think most of the stuff that I make, the more you listen to it, the easier it is to listen to. Um, <laughs> wow, there's a pitch. <laughs> you should listen to my music. The more you listen to it, the better it is, I swear. If you hate it the first time, the second time, you won't mind it as much. Um, I don't know, I listen to it a lot. Because I have to. Um, I think I think I do kind of make what I want to hear sometimes. What I would like to hear. What I'm in the mood to hear. Sometimes I make happy stuff. Sometimes I make sad stuff. What type of... Is it... Is there like class warfare almost between between uh, and what separates it and what you know? I don't know. I think um, I think what I do classifies just as much a composer or um, or a songwriter um, as someone that sits down with a guitar. And I guess I can say that because I do that because I'll sit down with a guitar and write one. Um, but. I think in certain areas there is a, a definite delineation. You'll hear people use like the term like music editor, um, which, I mean, that is what I do. I am a music editor, you know, uh, but I don't edit music to fit someone else's viewpoint. Like I'm not editing down a song to fit with someone else's movie or I'm not editing music down to fit in a 30 second commercial. You know, I'm taking other people's art and editing in a way that makes it my own art. You know, everybody knows what a Campbell's soup can looks like. You know, everybody knows what Warhol's soup can looks like. Too. Yeah. So that's kind of how I look at that. But no, I mean, there are some people that are like, oh, well, um, can you do anything musically? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I can. I don't know. I, uh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it like that. I shouldn't say it like it's this big all-out war, or whatever. It's weird to have your musicality questioned, I guess, is all. Because when you're sitting in a coffee shop playing a guitar and singing your songs, and you are the most vulnerable that you can be as an artist, that's what we tell ourselves. Oh, I was singing the songs about my most intimate breakup. Oh. You know, and that's so raw. And, but no one ever questions that you're a fucking musician because they see you there singing a song and playing. But when I sit down for 24 hours straight and take tiny bits of sound and compose it in a way that you can actually listen to it, probably exposing more of my soul and then still have people be like, so do you do you like do you DJ? Do you, can you can you play an instrument? Did you study music? That's interesting. It's different. That's um that's something I've never felt as an artist before. But it's kinda cool. That's it, yeah. <laughs> I say that, I can finally use the site now. Um I mean, it's funny, because that, that's actually what uh, what House of Glitch kind of meant. Like, that was... I, I was making a lot of references to, like, the, like the, the gay voguing houses of New York. I actually, uh, right before I started doing uh, music full-time, I saw a performance in New York by the House of Ninja that was doing a tribute to Willie Ninja. And... 
uh, I loved the the idea that these these little gay boys in the 80s had like no place to go because uh, you know they were thrown out of their own homes and disowned by their families for being gay and so they're in the streets of New York and and this group of guys is like hey come on in it's cool we've created our own culture we we create our own art we we created our own world and they supported each other and it was very uh, very fraternal in that way and so I loved that idea of the collaborative community of art and that's why I've actually done a lot of work on Indaba because uh, that's kind of what they stand for and then um, and then I came across Hit Record and Hit Record was everything that I needed at that point in my life I needed I needed a, a fellowship a community of other artists I needed people that I could bounce ideas off of and not feel judged I needed I needed a way to get certain things out there I needed I needed a place to express myself and and I needed to feel validated and and not validated by just random people, but by people that do what I do, you know. It, it's something very different for other musicians, filmmakers, and artists to tell you that, that they respect what you do. Especially when I have so much respect for what they do, you know. I'm, I'm honored to be a part of this community because there's a level... There's a level at hit record that is so much higher than um, well, than anywhere I've seen online, um, and there's definitely a huge sense of community. I feel I feel safe. I feel safe to be whatever artist I want to be, you know, and nothing is ever expected of me other than just to be. House of Glitch. I I don't have to do anything at hit record except be that and that's good enough. And um I uh let's see. Um I liked the idea of how hit record worked too. Um that it was uh that was like self-sustained, um, that all of the artists got paid for their work, um, that anything was up for remix. I, th I think the one thing that Joe said in the New Deal that struck with me the most is that here remix isn't theft, it's an honor. And I was like, wow, wow, what a, what a beautiful idea. Like, it's amazing. That's the way it should be. Because when I remix somebody, it's not because I think I can do it so much better than they can. It's because I absolutely love what they have done. And I want my chance to be hands-on with it. I want, I want to be a part of that world, you know? I didn't remix Nebula Lullaby because I thought I could do it better than Sean fucking Ono Lennon. I did it because I wanted to spend eight hours glitching up his guitar separate from glitching up his vocals and then lay them on top of each other and see what happened, you know? I wanted to spend the day with my hands dirty in Sean Ono Lennon's world. That's all that's about. And, and, and this gives me the opportunity to do that. I love that. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? That's I love my hats. Oh. <laughs>
so like I would go in and change the individual pitch of each of them. <laughs> taking each of the each of those and taking the pitch down four steps. So like it's not me just like slowing it down like. So that's real time. Not gonna be a good shot. Well, don't get my ass. I hit record. <laughs> Give him that. Use that as a bumper. Lucy, you go away. Bowser, come here. Ready? Oh, kitty parkour, go! Pew! Come on. Yes. Come on, you can go higher than that. Come on. Oh, come on, you need to come over here. You gotta start over on this side. Come here. Come over here. Come over here. You can't kitty parkour. Come on. <laughs> oh, D6. Maybe you could use those somehow. Yep. Look, found sound. Found sound. Huh? It can't be an actual song. That's not what I'm just playing chords. some different chords and then figure out how they work together.
need you to sing. Usually just talk to him. Hey, buddy. And put him on the floor and like kind of push him over. And just play around with him. Oh, he hates this. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Y'all weren't even scared? Click on it. Oh, Nothing big, nothing grand, nothing you I started with, I just loaded the track in there, and I was like, oh, well, there was that door slam, so that'll be the first thing that I listened to, because I like the way that sounded. And then I found these pieces, so, I mean, we treat those almost like a, like a little uh, snare. And I'm just going to line up those clicking sounds, so they're a little bit more in line with the nothing tempo. Nothing Okay, do, um... Step one is selecting the sound. Say that, I guess. <laughs> Just all that? Yeah. <laughs> um... As concisely as possible. Oh, beautiful. Well, step one is selecting the sound, and then step two would be to uh, to arrange those sounds in different ways and a little bit of trial and error, experimenting to see what it sounds like layered on top of something else or repeated in a different pattern. Uh, and then I guess step three from there would be um, uh, it would be kind of like carving out. Uh, the excess, the things that you don't need, um, and really, uh, really giving your song a uh, shape, and then, um, then you hit record. Then you hit record. Yes. Okay.